Okay, hopefully the mic's picking up. Uh, we're going to talk now about uh, what we're doing at Kinfolk, uh, continuing the Core OS legacy, what we're doing with flat car and locomotive. Um, I did introduce myself briefly at the beginning. Um, where's the clicker? Okay, great. Uh, so I'm responsible for business development, but I also work uh, a lot with our existing customers. I'm responsible for customer success as well, so um, I work with the customers and kind of get a lot of exposure to the challenges that they're facing. Um, uh, who is Kinfolk? We're, uh, we have a, an open source driven business model, so everything we do is 100% open source. Um, we're very active in the cloud native community, built on a lot of expertise in Linux and security, and work with a lot of big companies out there in the industry, as well as a lot of small ones as well, a lot of uh, technology leaders. Um, and one of those companies that you see that we've worked with, actually probably the very first project that as a company we worked on was with a customer called CoreOS back in 2015. And um, back when CoreOS was founded, they, uh, they had a mission which was to secure the internet, and which sounded like a very, very grand ambition at the time, um, and probably still does, and is still a valid mission, I think, today. Um, and, but what they meant by this was, or, or kind of the mechanisms they, they wanted to get out there to enable the security of the internet were, were quite a few, really, just like looking at all of the attack vectors, how can you minimize them by reducing the attack surface of uh, the operating system of applications, by um, making file systems immutable where they don't need to be changed, let's, let's lock things down. With the principle of least privilege, so uh, creating policies that say what applications explicitly can do and then restrict them from doing anything else that's not explicitly granted. Um, so things like pod security policies, network policies. Um, automatically updating, uh, the, you know, the number of servers that are out there with old versions of code on that wouldn't be vulnerable if only an admin had been able to go and up update it. So how do you make that aut automatic? And addressing challenges around the security of the container runtime. And in fact, that's where uh, we at Kinfolk first started working with, uh, with CoreOS because we worked on the Rocket container runtime, uh, which was designed to be more secure than the, uh, the Docker runtime at the time. Um, so. Um, CoreOS also talked about a, another concept which they call Giphy or uh, Google's infrastructure for everyone else. Uh, and this was really kind of building on this idea of if we're securing the internet, how do we run it at scale as well? How do we run applications at scale? And so um, they looked at, at that time at a lot of concepts that I think to this group now are, are pretty much our everyday concepts uh, of containers and, and scalability and uh, immutability and these kind of things, um, but back then were, were not known at all outside of the hyperscale companies. So, um, you know, so, so, so this was kind of tied together with that idea of building security is also building scalability and robustness. And they actually built uh, really a whole stack here to deliver uh, Giphy and security together. Um, and you'll, I'm sure you'll know most of these projects um, the, the foundation of it was the you know, the, what the company was originally named after CoreOS, the operating system, Container Linux. Um, on top of that, the runtime that I mentioned for containers. And then they invented etcd, um, built on some academic work that had been out there around consensus algorithms and how do you distribute state in, a, uh, in, a, um, you know, in an environment where you may have machines going away. Uh, and, and that became etcd. Um, on top of that, they, they got into container orchestration, initially with their own project fleet, and then they rapidly adopted Kubernetes when that came out uh, and built an enterprise version of, of Kubernetes, really the first enterprise Kubernetes product. And then on top of that, they built a container registry and um, a, a security scanner to go with that container registry, so Quay and Claire. Um, so quite a lot of technology in there and it was all going great and you know really they were driving the industry in a, in a great way and, th and then this big fish uh, red hat came along and saw what they were doing and thought that's great we can gobble them up and do some, all sorts of great things and of course then another bigger fish came along 
Um, so that's, that's the little bit of animation you get for the evening. Um, and, and what happened as a result of that was, um, you know, some of these projects continued and thrived. Some, some of them merged into Red Hat technologies and some of them went away. So, you know, Quay and Claire, uh, both active Red Hat pro pro uh, services and projects. Uh, and in fact, it's been great to see Red Hat even um, open sourced Quay because that, that had been a closed source um, product. Tectonic's been end of life, but some of the technologies and concepts have merged into OpenShift and have become more broadly used within the industry. Um, etcd is, is not going anywhere because that is absolutely the heart of Kubernetes and it's an active project within CNCF and in fact it's been contributed to CNCF since, um, since the acquisition, so that's a great thing. Um, Rocket went into CNCF and also kicked off this um, open containers initiative uh, which led to the creation of the Container D project which addresses some of those kind of criticisms of the original Docker runtime. And, um, and so what's happened is you've had a lot of uh, momentum around Container D. We've had um, other uh, container runtimes like Cryo being, um, being created and uh, Rocket's actually been retired. But you know, not that big an issue because it, it achieved what it set out to do which was to standardize and, um, that interface and make that a multi-vendor initiative and then CoreOS Container Linux is still very widely used, um, but uh, Red Hat has merged some of those technologies into a new OS called Fedora CoreOS, confusingly, quite a different OS, even though they're still using the name. Um, and uh, the, the challenge with that is for people who want commercial support, you only get it if you buy into the full OpenShift stack. Um, and even if you don't, then it, it's quite a different kind of experience. But nonetheless, uh, Red Hat's recently announced that that's going to be end of life as of May 26th. And then as of, I think, September this year, um, all of the images of CoreOS will be pulled as well. So, um, so that's uh, clearly reached the end of the road. Um, I mean, I think if you look at that full stack of what CoreOS achieved, and uh, I mean, they had, a, they had an office here in Berlin, so some of you may have known the folks, some of you may even have worked there, um, but it was a pretty small office here. They had a smallish office in San Francisco, a couple of people in New York, and that was it. It was a few dozen engineers. I mean, it's, I think, you know, any of us in the development space looking at what they achieved have to be Im impressed. And, you know, this is a quote from one of the engineers that they had, and I think this is how they all felt. It was pretty astounding what they built. Um, and at Kinfold, we were, we were honored to have been part of that original rocket project and to have really kind of been an extended part of their team. Uh, and, and we've kind of looked at some of what they've done and want to take some of these technologies forward in a way that maybe is a bit closer to the spirit of what CoreOS was trying to do back when they set up um, and, a, and kind of a little bit le more away from uh, kind of where Red Hat's taking it. And um, I mean, I, I love this quote here from the, sa the same chap uh, who, so, you know, re really kind of respects what we've done and says, you know, he trusts us with the CoreOS legacy. So that quote was kind of the inspiration for this talk title in a way, because we see ourselves taking that CoreOS legacy forward. Um, so how are we doing that? Uh, as you probably guessed from the, uh, you know, the slide, you're looking at the things that are being end of life. And, uh, you know, we feel that there's a lot of life in the, in the um, model that they had for deploying Kubernetes and also um, in uh, CoreOS Container Linux. Um, in the case of locomote, in the case of um, Tectonic, uh, it's a little bit harder because a lot of Tectonic was closed source. Um, there was an open, a, a fully open source distro from one of the uh, CoreOS engineers called Typhoon built off of um, the open source pieces of Tectonic and kind of completed into a solution. And that's what's become our project uh, locomotive, although we've taken it on quite a long way from that. Flat car's a lot easier because uh, all of CoreOS container Linux was open, so we've just forked it, and um, you know we're taking it forward. And I'll talk a bit more about how we're doing that, but it's it's much more of a, a linear uh, continuation. Um, so I'll start first with flat car. Uh, CoreOS had three channels uh, for flat car for, for CoreOS. They're called alpha, beta, and stable. And we've added something called Edge, which um, has got a lot of people excited because there's a challenge with 
an OS like uh, CoreOS, where a lot of people who want the very latest cutting edge technologies want to use it. But at the same time now, this is a very mainstream enterprise technology stack. And how do you kind of square that circle? Well, you have your, your enterprise release tra train, which is alpha beta stable. And at the same time, you can throw experimental stuff into edge. And, and so this is, I think, got a lot of people really um, kind of coming back to this model and, and playing with it. Um, the, the images are out there for all the major platforms. And some of the clouds have it integrated already. And we're kind of working with the other clouds to make it a, a first class citizen OS that you can really easily um, you know, schedule new instances with that OS. Uh, and we have, we have an update service and uh, an update server that uh, hands out these images as well, um, which, uh, which interfaces with the, uh, the built-in, yeah, was CoreOS, now, uh, now Flatcar, um, auto-updating engine. So the, uh, the, ser the host queries the server, is there a new version available? If there is, it pulls it and updates it. Um, we have also built and, re and released uh, an open source version of what was the proprietary uh, CoreOS core update service. Um, and so this is um, fully out there. Anyone can use it. It's called Project Nebraska. You can find it under Kinfolk GitHub. Um, and, uh, and this is, allows you to do rate limiting of those updates, define you know, which servers in which groups get which versions. Uh, and it also gives you that audit trail and monitoring and be able to see which, which updates are happening and, and when they happened or if they failed, what happened and how did it roll back, things like that. So this is pretty cool. We, we don't have time for a demo of this, but um, check it out. It's, uh, if, you, if you're using CoreOS, it's a great way of actually managing a fleet of machines um, uh, to migrate to Flatcar. Uh, and talking of that migration, um, it is really simple because really Flatcar is just the same as CoreOS Container Linux uh, right now. It's just a new version um, and you, that you pull from a different server. So just update the server equals in your config file and that's pretty much all there is to it. Um, do check out the instructions. There's like you know, one or two other things that you might want to look at. But it's, uh, everyone who's tried it has basically said it's completely seamless. And in fact, there was a... Um, what's the date on this? Fe February 12th, so just a couple of uh, weeks ago, not even that. <coughs> um, the, uh, the team at Metal put out a, a blog post just saying, yep, we upgraded to Flatcar. It's, um, you know, it was seamless, it was straightforward. Um, so I encourage you to do that. Um, definitely before May 26th, when all of the security and maintenance updates stop on, uh, on CoreOS, if you are a CoreOS user today. Um, we even got, and this is stop press, yes, this was yesterday in the register, so you know you've made it when you're in the register. Um, and, uh, and so we got a nice shout out, shout out there uh, for, um, you know, for being the, the alternative that, that, in fact, Red Hat is pointing to as well. So, um, so where are we at right now? Uh, we, we have a dedicated team. Um, so we've actually restructured our engineering team and, and have a dedicated to a team within that focused on operating system security, uh, led by a former AWS Linux program manager sitting right there. Um, so he knows his way around Linux. Um, and we've got, we've taken over builds, uh, CI, we've got you know, tests, all of that stuff working, uh, which is quite a lot of work. Um, and Edge and Alpha channels are completely independent now of upstream. And uh, beta and stable will be as well over the next uh, few weeks. So it, it, we really get to the point where we can update everything independently and start to kind of really diverge from upstream, which you know, we have to, um, given there's only a couple of months left of upstream. Um, and we have support infrastructure and enterprise customers with thousands of hosts and that kind of thing. So you know, we're set up to actually make this a viable ongoing project you know, for the foreseeable future. Um, talking of the future, for Flatcar, there's a lot of things we want to do. Um, you know, CoreOS had pretty much stagnated over the last couple of years, and we've had that feedback from people saying, God, well, you know, when are you, when are you finally going to get a new version of Docker? When are you finally going to upgrade the kernel version? Um, all these things we want to do, uh, you know, update the kernel. Uh, we want to do a lot more around BPF because that's becoming a big thing. So 
BPF with C groups V2 has a lot of exciting stuff for, for Kubernetes in it. So one of the reasons we want to do this is because it dry, will help us drive innovation up into the higher layers of the stack as well. Um, but the bread and butter of maintaining security updates is, you know, is obviously just as important uh, as well for a lot of users. And we've also had uh, feedback from some customers that they want better debugging tools. Uh, you know, some portion of my, of my fleet is crashing. I'm getting kernel crashes. Uh, you know, how do I diagnose that? CoreOS didn't have great tools for doing that. There are some things that we can, we can do and, and bundle in you know, without kind of compromising the, the minimal distribution ethos because we absolutely need to keep that. But um, while keeping with that philosophy, add better visibility and debugging into, into the distro. So lots of things we are already thinking of and we've had input from customers. If you've got things you want to see, we'd love to hear. Uh, this is all done in public, throw it up into the GitHub. And as my first bullet point here is it says, we actually want to be really transparent about this. And we're going to be publishing our roadmap and sharing what we plan to work on. And so you'll be able to see in the open where things are going. So we really want this to be a, you know, a, a involving the whole community. So, so that's, that's it for the Linux layer. Now I'm going to move up to the Kubernetes layer. Uh, locomotive, um, uh, oh, I didn't even explain. Does anyone know where the name flat, com flat car comes from? Because, okay, we've got a couple, but uh, <laughs> so it's, yeah, a couple of train enthusiasts. It's, it's, the, it's the wagon on a, on a train on which you put containers. So if you want to take containers off a ship, right, everyone's, everyone sees all the ship metaphors, but the whole point of containers is they're intermodal. When you put them on a train, they go on a flat car. So it's, it's the thing at the top of which you, you put your containers. So um, when you know that, it's an awesome name. <laughs> if only all the world knew that. Um, so we're going to go from the flat car to the locomotive. Uh, how are we driving Kubernetes forward? Um, so, so what are we doing with the locomotive? First of all, it, we're not making any kind of custom version of Kubernetes. We're not doing an open core thing because this is kinfolk. We don't do open core. It's all open source. Um, we're, we're scouting around what are the best of breed open source technologies that you have to put together to really create a viable Kubernetes deployment and putting them together and uh, enabling people to keep, uh, keep up uh, with the upstream releases that are coming out um, rapidly kind of integrating them, testing them, putting them together. Um, trying to make it consistent. So one of the things that you find is um, w when you actually go and deploy uh, Kubernetes and you put in all the different pieces that you need, like storage and networking and, um, you know, and, and monitoring and all, all these other um, components that you add in, it starts to get very messy because there's a lot of different things you need to think about. Well, let's try and make it as consistent as possible as to how you manage all of those different things. Um, it's fully self-hosted, same as um, Tectonic was, which is this thing that um, CoreOS really introduced, and we kind of take that uh, uh, further, I think, than it has been before. And sensible, secure default config. So we really believe in trying to make this secure um, out of the box. You know, Kubernetes out of the box is the opposite of secure. <laughs> um, so, so let's try and actually kind of make it such that people don't shoot themselves in the foot quite as much with regards to security. And then, and then the last thing is, you know, we want this to be a platform for innovation, not just like pulling the, the, uh, you know, the old projects from three, four years ago that are all proven, but actually make this something that we and the community can try out and deploy new things uh, with. So, um, and, and this may be a whole range of things. We, first of all, though, the kind of areas that we really want to innovate are around security and monitoring. Um, we have a project called Inspector Gadget, which some of you may know, um, which uh, allows you to apply various BPF tools into the cluster. A lot of those are around security and monitoring. Um, and you know, we've, we want to do a whole lot more in that area as well. Um, one point I'd like to make here in terms of the philosophy of how we think about this, um, and I've seen this with, so, with some distros, they, it's basic, the, the distro is basically an installer, and maybe it bundles in networking and a couple of other things. But um, for other, other really key infrastructure components, they just say, oh, there's some upstream YAML from the project. Sure, we're compatible with that. Deploy it just like you would your app. And effectively, what they're saying is, you know, the, the Kubernetes layer is the, 
um, you know, is the boundary between infrastructure and applications. And you should run your infrastructure components in just the same way you run your app. You know, five times a day updates or however frequently, as soon as it comes out upstream, there's a new version, just pull that in. And uh, I think, in my view, this is actually broken because I think the, the, the right layer is to, is, to, is to think about what is the, the infrastructure on which your developers are deploying applications. So that, that is kind of the, it's the organizational boundary between the operations team and the application developers. And it should also be a boundary in terms of how you think about the components that go into, um, into your, your overall distro. So we think of locomotive as the full distro you know, the containers plus the Kubernetes kernels. The containers is like, the, the infrastructure containers or the components are like the, the bundled user space um, tools that you get with a Linux distro. Um, that's, that's my opinionated view anyway. Um, the, what the stack looks like um, is, you know, we, we actually separate out this idea of the comp those components that you deploy from the underlying Kubernetes engine. So. Um, the goal is you can run on top of any managed service. Um, and obviously we have Flatcar, so if you're using our installer with Flatcar and Kubernetes, it's gonna put those together. Um, the self-hosted, so we use BootCube for, um, for deployment. And this is how we've kind of gone beyond what anyone else has done up to now. We even kind of go through this phase of moving Kubelet from running standalone on the host to running inside a pod. And um, I think CoreOS, uh, I tried to do that, never actually got that uh, published, but we've got that working, uh, which kind of blows my mind to think of that. Um, and then once you do that, in-place updates of your infrastructure um, components plus the control plane, you know, are just uh, pretty simple. And we'll do some demos for you in a minute to, sh to show that. Um, the, 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 the common component framework here is, the idea is we, that whatever you're deploying, whether that's a, you know, an open EBS plugin or, or Prometheus or a Contour or something, yeah, the, the way you configure that feels exactly the same to you. It's not like you have to go and learn a new tool each time you add in one of these components. And it's, uh, we really simplify the, the configuration. Um, and we're trying to run it on all, all the different platforms. The, the architecture, this, this is kind of the, the vision for where we want to get to. So, that, so at the moment, um, we, we have this local CTL tool, and that actually, bun for a version of the tool, it bundles all of the upstream component binaries. Um, we're gonna have that as an option for air-gapped uh, deployments. Um, we're also gonna uh, have the ability to, to download those separate uh, components based on the manifest. Um, but there's a, there's a top-level um, config file which defines defines your cluster info, defines the version, uh, and then you can either bring um, component configs into that or set, have them in separate files, whichever works best for how you're managing it. Um, those, are defi those are defined using the HashiCorp HCL, uh, which is the same way you program Terraf Terraform, um, a declarative model, pretty simple. I, kind of, I think it's a little bit easier than YAML, but you know, it's, it's similar. Um, and then local CTL takes takes that declarative config and applies it to the cluster. If, it's if it requires it to build a cluster, it'll do that via Terraform um, and BootCube. If it requires it to deploy things into the cluster, it'll create Helm charts and apply those using Helm. And in fact, even the um, control plane itself is deployed using Helm. So that's kind of a new thing as well, I think. And then, um, and then obviously it can talk to the Cube API in, for some things as well. So, so that's kind of the, the top level architecture. Um, the components that we've built in have been driven a lot by work that we've done with customers so far and what we're hearing, um, but this list will grow. But you can see there's a whole load of things that we already have out of the box from authentication to storage, including things like Ceph and OpenEBS, um, uh, metrics, backup, auto-scaling, networking. We've got a nice site-to-site -site VPN, which is um, which can hook into the AWS uh, VPN service. So you could have, say, something running on bare metal or in packet, which sets up a VPN using the AWS's built-in VPN service. Flatcar Linux update operator uh, is, is a, a neat component because it allows you to coordinate those automated updates of the underlying OS. So if you think about it, if you have a container OS that's doing automatic updates, that could really mess with your Kubernetes layer if, if it's not done in a managed way. 
So it allows you to actually coordinate the underlying OS updates <coughs> with, the, uh, with Kubernetes. So it, it actually um, drains the node before it, before it reboots the box with, a, with an OS update. And there's a lot more things we want to work on as well and add in. Um, so overall, what we're trying to get to here is a user experience that's got as much of the simplicity as, of using a GKE type service out of the box, but that you control and you manage and it's open source and you can play with it however you want. Um, you know, command line um, for managing clusters and components in the same way. So the way you would update components is the same way as you update your control plane. <coughs> Um, with a much simpler config than you've ever had to um, do up to now with a self self installed Kubernetes, and also a dashboard for monitoring and control. And you might say, yet another dashboard. Yes, we've built yet another dashboard. Uh, and you might say, are you completely loco? And uh, we think not, <laughs> um, because we did um, we did go out there and looked at all of the solutions that were there. And you know, we had a number of things we wanted to see. And we, you know, we'd, have ha we'd have preferred to have picked something off the shelf if it was there and did what we wanted. Uh, we wanted it to be open source, obviously. Um, that that kind of goes without saying. We want it to be an active project. We want it to be independent of a distro. So there are some where it's very tied together with that specific distro. Um, so it's still open source, but it's very hard to kind of tangle it apart. Um, we wanted it to be on a modern, up-to-date framework. Um, you know, the UI world, the front-end world moves so fast, um, and kind of keeping up with the latest security and the latest performance and the latest capabilities is, is, uh, was pretty key to us. We were also looking for it to be modular and extensible. We had things we wanted to plug into it. Um, and obviously, a nice, clean, modern UI. And we wanted it not just for monitoring, so some of the dashboards out there allow you to monitor, but don't allow you to kind of perform operations as well. And, and, and so, Looking at all of these, we said there's, there's nothing out there that does this. Um, so we're actually in the process of building one that does. And you're the first group of people we've ever said that to <laughs> in public. Um, we haven't, this isn't, st this is, so this is still a little bit stealth. It's still a bit behind the scenes. Um, we will be, um, you know, we've, we've got some work to do to get it to the point where we feel comfortable releasing it. Um, but, you know, you'll be the first to hear about it. Um, so where we're at today with locomotive, so all of all of the cluster bring up, tear down, a bunch of these components all implemented, supported on Packet and AWS and bare metal, and um, you know the fact they're there is proven because we have actually got locomotive deployed with a number of customers um, in some of its kind of early work in progress versions. Um, we don't yet re really feel comfortable um, uh, fully uh, going. Uh, calling it kind of a V1.0, but we get, we're, we're getting close to that point and there's a number of things we're gonna do over the next few weeks. Um, you know, getting the versioning update, upgrade process um, out, um, customization support for components, dashboard, um, obviously getting that integrated. And then just like doing all of the work that's gonna to take to get what we have internally and doing kind of one-off things for customers into an open source project with documentation, with you know governance processes and things like that, that we can we can put out. But you will see that happening. I mean, literally over the next next few weeks, the team's working really really hard to just get our first stake in the ground of the first um, public open source repo um, that everyone can get their hands on. So, um, so that's that summary is how we think we're continuing the CoreOS legacy. Um, we think the spirit lives on in us. Uh, we're working very hard to make. Uh, Flatcar, Container Linux, the platform that everyone wants to deploy Kubernetes onto. Uh, CoreOS was super popular. We think we can uh, kind of rekindle that and take it forward. And we're pretty excited about Locomotive. It's, um, you know, it, it's, it's our first attempt to, to, to really kind of push forward the envelope of Kubernetes. And, and it's a community project. It's open source. We would love for people to get involved as well. So. With that, I'm actually going to hand over for the demo to, so you can uh, meet a couple of our engineering directors, uh, Iago and, and Joaquin. Okay. Thank you.
Hi, so I'm Iago. I'm a director of the engineering in the cloud division at Kingfolk. And I have a cheat sheet so I don't forget anything about my demo. So let's see. Okay, can you see that all the way to the back? Yes. Yeah, good. Cool. So, yeah, I wanted to show uh, a bit how simple it is to install a locomotive cluster. And so, yeah, what you need to do is just run local CTL. And in this case, this version, uh, 001, this is important because we'll later we'll be updating, uh, cluster install. But of course, this takes a while, so I, uh, I don't think we have much time. So what I did was I pre-installed the cluster, uh, so we, we saved some time. Uh, but of course, uh, you need some configuration here. You cannot just do cluster install and then your cluster, your, your dream cluster will appear. So we have some, some config file, and I'm going to show you that, that to you now. So yeah, this cluster is running on packet. So uh, you can see here that we are running a packet cluster. So this is the HCL language that we use to configure a cluster, as uh, Andy said. And yeah, you set up some the usual stuff like the, your cluster name, uh, the number of controller nodes, and we call uh, masters controllers. Uh, so yeah, you can have one like in this demo because uh, yeah, I didn't want to do an HA cluster for a demo, or you can have three or more for your HA needs. So in production, you should really do that. Um, yeah, you can configure your DNS. So uh, right now we support two two ways. You can use Route 53, or you can use external DNS and bring your own DNS. Uh, yeah, in this in the demo, I, I chose Route 53. Yeah, and then other stuff like the facility um, and also the OS version, uh, Flatcar, of course. And in this case, I chose uh, the Edge channel because you know I want to do demos on something that's probably breaking. So <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm like that. Um, yeah, and then other stuff like the public keys for your servers and some uh, uh, network stuff. Um, yeah, apart from your controllers, you also want workers. So we have this concept of worker pools. So you can have different worker pools, like if you have a, a pool for storage uh, or a pool that's, that you know, has a, a lot of CPU capacity, so you can choose different kinds of instances uh, for, your, for your worker pools. Uh, in this case, I have two uh, workers. And again, I'm using Edge. Uh, yeah, I, I said why before. Uh, so yeah, this is a cluster. Uh, and then there will be the components that Andy was mentioned before. Uh, and so we want to show you how easy it is to set up some components. So the configuration is here. For example, for a cert manager, we have to configure uh, the email uh, that is used for the certificates and the namespace. So yeah, that's pretty, pretty easy. Uh, for Contour, which we use for uh, yeah, uh, Ingress, uh, yeah, you, just, you don't have to specify anything. So it just works like this. Uh, we use Metal LB in Packet uh, to get a load balancing because Packet doesn't provide a load balancing uh, service like AWS or any other cloud providers uh, because it's a, it's a bare metal uh, cloud provider. So we use Metal LB and here we just have to specify what's the public uh, IP that you will use for your load balancer. Yeah, and then the metric server which doesn't need any other configuration. Um, so yeah, that's that. Um, yeah, so the cluster is running. I can show you kubectl, I don't know, get pod slash a to see that something is running. Uh, yeah, we have a lot of a lot of pods here. Uh, yeah, but as much as I like the command line, uh, I also like to see the clusters in a dashboard UI. So I, I want to show you the yeah I think first public dashboard uh, locomotive dashboard uh, thing, and here it is. <laughs> Boom! Wow. We have some round things and then some things, some <laughs> clickable things, so that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, so here you can see what you would expect from a dashboard, like uh, your overview, CPU, memory usage, uh, how, much, how many pods are uh, running successfully, 100%, uh, yeah, thank God. Uh, yeah, some events that happened uh, uh, in the meantime. You can see your workloads, uh, yeah, stateful sets, replica sets, uh, you know, your deployments, uh, your pods, of course. Uh, you can also filter uh, by namespace. So we don't have anything running in the default namespace, but I don't know. I guess in the Dex namespace, we have running. We have Dex running. So yeah, things like that. Uh, yeah, uh, I think Joaquin will mention it later. But this is a very early. Uh, uh, you know, uh, we're showing this in in a very early stage. So there's still some rough edges to polish. 
Um, yeah, so what I'm going to do next is I'm going to install uh, a, a new component on the Kubernetes uh, cluster. It's the Flatcar Linux update operator that Andy mentioned before. Um, so let's see that that's not running right now. It is not. So there's no, nothing about Flatcar here in POTS. So yeah, let's do that. Uh, so on local CTL, we're still going to use this 001 version. Uh, you can do component list. And this, these are the available components that uh, Annie showed in the previous slide. So yeah, let's, let's just install the Flatcar Linux update operator. Uh, let's add it to the uh, cluster config. So we'll add a new component, Flatcar Linux update operator. And it doesn't require any configuration, so we just leave it like that. And now we'll do uh, component install. And so it doesn't go through all the components to update them. Let's say it directly operator. <coughs> yeah, so it's now installing a component. And hopefully it will succeed. Yeah, it's successfully installed. Uh, yeah, wrong tab. So let's refresh. And yeah, now it's running. Uh, so we have three <coughs> agent pods that run on each uh, node of the cluster and then the operator itself that you know manages all this yeah so yeah what's next yeah next thing i want to show you is uh, uh, to bring your attention to the version of the cluster so it's uh, v117.1 uh, and yeah if you go to the nodes you can see that all the nodes are running that version too uh, yeah, 117.1, 117.1, 117 and this is actually a nice opportunity to show you uh, how the kubelet is self-hosted. So if you go to workloads, you can see here that if I search for kubelet, it's a daemon set, so a normal Kubernetes object, and in the pods, you will see it uh, running there too. Uh, yeah, and also uh, I'm going to do an update of the locomotive version, and this will update both the Kubernetes version and one component. I chose one at random, it's DEX in this case. So uh, if we search for DEX here, you'll see that it's running version 2.20.0. It will be updated uh, in a minute. So I will start the update process now. And since this takes some time, uh, I will hand it off to Joachim, which, uh, who, will, 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 who will talk to you a bit more about the design of the um, uh, dashboard and do a couple of more demos. So let's start this update. Instead of local CTL 001, let's do local CTL 002. And I'll do cluster install uh, because our install is item potent. So you can uh, yeah, just install again. And if it doesn't update, it will update. We'll probably change the name later because install doesn't really match this. But yeah, as I said, this is a really early preview. So let's just do that. And you see it's using Terraform behind the scenes to actually do the update, and then it will use Helm to actually update the, the control plane and everything. So let's see when Terraform plan uh, shows you the plan. We'll just say yes without looking because we're living on the edge. <laughs> and yeah, let's do that and, and introduce you, Kim. And I'll press enter. Cool. Uh, hi. So, <coughs> let's see. Yeah, so um, Andy already explained to you why we chose to create yet another dashboard. Um, yeah, and that's what I'm here to talk about. But first, I have to give you a disclaimer that this is like highly unstable code written in JavaScript. Um, and uh, running in a, in a cluster that is not high, high availability, that is updating in the back, on the background, um, and doing all that while at a resolution that we didn't design this uh, dashboard for. So uh, if it goes wrong, just, you know, don't judge me. Um, yeah, so one of the things that, uh, that is very important, I think, in the, in the reason why we chose to design a new um, dashboard or create a new dashboard, is that uh, we wanted this to be like, of course, the, the, the dashboard for locomotive, but also a generic one. And uh, <coughs> sorry, the way that we, you know, I think uh, are managing to do this 
is by, by allowing front-end plugins. So that means that if you want to use the dashboard for your uh, own Kubernetes distribution or something like that, uh, and you don't want uh, to use the same plugins as we do, you just have to uh, not include them, and, uh, and that's it. So we have a bit of uh, isolation in there. So um, yeah, one of the plugins that we have uh, it's, um, it's for, for a project, uh, it's for part of a project that I think Andy mentioned called Inspector Gadget. And uh, if I go here and things are working, seem to be working, you see that there is a, a, an icon there. So this is coming from this plugin that gives you traces or trace loops. So uh, the concept of a trace loop here is like a, a, a trace. So it's like a, you know, a list of the system calls. Uh, but with minimal uh, overhead running in the, in the kernel. And um, yeah, we have this installed in Locomotive in this case. And when you click here, you should see, uh, you know, <laughs> the list of traces. But let's say that you are running a demo and they don't work. Uh, and um, or maybe the, even the pod died, right? So if the pod died, you cannot come to this view because you cannot access something that does not exist. So we have another view here. Uh, called traces and uh, and the traces as you can see on the status here this lists all the pods uh, or actually all the traces for all the pods uh, that we had so if I go here to any one and it will of course work now uh, you can see that you know these are the traces uh, so again the system calls so the idea here is that if you have a, a pod that suddenly died and you don't know why, you can go to this view and you can go and say, okay, you know, let me see what happened. You see the system calls, things fail. And, um, and you can, of course, go here, download the log, send it to whoever is uh, responsible for fixing it. And um, yeah, so um, that's, um, yeah, that's pretty much, uh, I guess, uh, one of the most important uh, aspects of, of, uh, of the design uh, we chose to, to do. This is only one plugin, we, we, we will have uh, many more. So like I said, you know, if you don't have the, the Spectre Gadget plugin, then this uh, whole menu and view and, uh, and the route here will not uh, be available. And um, yeah, and so, so we hope that this makes it very flexible for other community, communities to, to join in. Uh, let me see what else I could say. Maybe I'll just hand it over back to, to Iago because I see that it's already updated. <laughs> so, yep, that's it. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Joachim. Um, so, yeah, we can see that this is updated. So, it's, one, it's now 117.3. Um, this is the control plane version. Uh, but of course, the kubelet is also being updated. So let's see how that's going. Um, yeah, so we have this kubelet here. It's still 117.1. That's fine because it does a rolling update over all the kubelets. So maybe this one is updated. Yeah, 117.3. This one is not updated yet. Uh, but yeah, it will be uh, in any, any time soon. So, so yeah. This shows a bit how the update works, and yeah, it mostly worked <laughs> even with only one uh, 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 API server. So yeah, uh, that's what I wanted to show with the update. Now let's see what's what else. Oh yeah, I wanted to show that how also Dex got updated. So if we go back to workloads and we filter with Dex, there it is. And it's now running version 2.21. So yeah, a huge improvement in minor version. <laughs> uh, yeah, anyway. Uh, yeah, I can check if the nodes are updated. Yeah, OK. The controller is updated already. This is updated. So I think everything should be updated. Uh, not yet. But yeah, it will, it will be updated eventually. Um, so I think that's it for the demo. And now we wanted to show you one last slide before we let you eat more or go. Uh, and this is uh, yeah, the slide about the cloud native rejects. So this is a conference that we organized. Uh, and it, it's happening always right before KubeCon. 
and it's for all the talks that get rejected. So we, we would like to take those talks because they are very good talks and the, re the re rejection rate for KubeCon is, is pretty high. And so, yeah, we do this right before every KubeCon. Next one in Amsterdam uh, in March 28th. Uh, that's, yeah, not, not uh, far in the future. So yeah, please check it out and, and join us if, if you can. It's, uh, it's really great. It's a really great event. It's uh, smaller and it has a very nice uh, vibe. So you can if actually talk to people and, and not just be there lost in the crowds. So yeah, thanks everybody. And yeah, that's all I had. Yeah, I think if you have any questions, uh, I can try to answer or defer. Yeah, Why in the back. you use a different version for the upgrade? Is, is other versions hard-coded somewhere in the tool or...? Yeah, so uh, as Andy said, uh, the versions are currently hard-coded on the <laughs> binary. So if you download a new version of the binary, we'll have all the, ver the versions hard-coded there. But our plans is to move to a manifest uh, way. So with one uh, version of the tool, you can you know, upgrade to an, a new one. Because yeah, you don't want to download everything uh, every time you want to update. Yep. Let's say I got a bunch of uh, servers in the rack, uh, all network on it, and so on. And I want to run a Kubernetes cluster uh, using Flatcar Linux uh, mm -hmm. and Locomotive. Uh, yes. What do I have to do to prepare that? So we support iPixie boot, and we support bare metal installation through iPixie. So you would, you would just have to you know, point uh, your servers to the, well, you, we, we, we actually run Matchbox uh, also by CoreOS. So you can actually group your, your servers there and then they will get the IPXE payload and they will install Flatcar and then they will install uh, Locomotive on top and they will be running. Matchbox is a service that basically, uh, in case someone's not familiar, uh, it's a service that allows you to basically inject an ignition config, which is what Flatcar digests in order to provision the server upon boot. So it allows you to do that in your own data center. Yeah, thanks. Okay, there's not more questions. We can wrap it up here. Thank you.